Lester and Frank Patrick both loved hockey, and in the years after the turn of the century, they became great stars. Lester played one season with Brandon in 1904. From 1906 to 1908, he played for the Montreal Wanderers and helped them to win the Stanley Cup not once, but twice. While Lester was doing that, Brother Frank played with McGill University and the Montreal Victorias. It was not until the Patricks moved to Nelson in 1909 that they played together. The two signed contracts with the fabulous Renfrew Millionaires, earning the whopping sum of $2,000. In the spring of 1911, Joe Patrick, who'd made a fortune from the sale of his interior lumber company, decided to move to the coast and pursue his dream of bringing professional hockey to the masses. Three cities, Victoria, Vancouver, and New Westminster, would be granted franchises. Now remember, we're talking the year 1911. The population of Victoria was only about 25,000. But there was a land boom on, and new buildings and subdivisions were popping up all over, with indications the population would double within a year or two. Money had just been approved for paved streets, boulevards, cluster lights, and sewers. As a result, lots on Dallas Road sold for $3,000 and in town for forty-five dollars Properties were bought on a Saturday night and sold on a Monday morning at handsome profits. The Patrick set about planning two artificial ice rinks. The league's showcase was to be a 10,000-seat, mostly brick, Vancouver arena. A Victoria arena under Leicester's control would be built entirely of wood with a seating of 3,500. The location? Way out in Oak Bay, near the Willows Exhibition Grounds. Lester picked that site because taxes would be much cheaper and the location was serviced by the Willow Streetcar. He purchased nine lots for $10,000 and within six months, the original Victoria Arena was built at a cost of less than 100 grand. At the time, top-level hockey in Canada was under the control of the National Hockey Association and players were signed for a season at a time. However, hockey was in an interesting phase of its evolution. Cities, and in some cases small towns, gathered hockey players together to challenge for the Canadian Amateur Championship. Anxious to produce winning teams, clubs would find some way to retain their best players, as well as to entice top players to dwell in their midst for a season. It was in this atmosphere that the Patricks began considering the manpower for their first three sports teams. With the first artificial rinks in Canada, their solution was simple. Pick out the players they wanted and offer them more than they'd received the year before. January 2nd, 1912. The first professional hockey game to be played on artificial ice was played right here in Victoria. It was 60 minutes of seven-a-side hockey with only one spare and with players from an unscheduled team as the on-ice officials. 2,500 fans saw the homeless New Westminster Royals, who shared the mainland arena with the Victoria Millionaires, set a dazzling pace to win 8-3. The Royals would go on to claim the short season's championship. Before the next season began, the Patricks negotiated for a series between the champions of the two leagues. The Stanley Cup would be at stake and was to be emblematic of the hockey championship of the world. The Victoria team, renamed the Aristocrats, was strengthened by the arrival of Bob Genji and Jack Ulrich. The Victoria Aristocrats also had the league's leading goal scorer as team captain. Tommy Dunderdale fired in 24 goals in 15 games, helping his team win the Western League title with a record of 10 wins and 5 losses. And so the scene was set for the first World Series of Hockey. The Quebec Bulldogs, with several top-ranking players, agreed to play a three-game exhibition series after the NHA, who were still fuming from the player rating, refusing to contest the Stanley Cup. The Willow streetcars were jammed, and the Victoria Arena was a sellout. The Victoria squad, which had plenty of speed, several deadly shooters, and a tough defense, won the first matchup. Because they were playing six-man hockey in the East, it was decided to play the second game using the Eastern rules, and that difference enabled the Lay Bulldogs to win the second game. But when they reverted to a seven-a-side game three, the Aristocrats dominated and won the game and the series. Tommy Smith and Lester Patrick led their respective squads, scoring four goals each. 
When pro hockey was ushered into our capital city, the amateurs also came bobbing up for recognition with a three-team league. Unfortunately, Patrick broke his hand just prior to the 1913-14 season, and by the time he returned to action, his aristocrats were in last place. But his return began a six-game win streak, and that together with Dunderdale's league-leading 23 goals boosted them into first place and a second league championship. The 1914-15 season opened with the NHA agreeing that the Stanley Cup would be up for competition between the Western and Eastern winners. The troubled New West Royals were sold to Portland and renamed the Rosebuds. However, it was Vancouver who claimed the title. The millionaires downed the Ottawa Senators in three straight games to be the first Western team to win the Stanley Cup. Just as hockey was rolling along famously, the Great War broke out and the Canadian government took over the Victoria Arena for military purposes. The authorities didn't commandeer Vancouver's arena, so they and Portland continued to operate while the Victoria franchise moved to Spokane. But the Canaries didn't fly and the team folded before the season's end. After the 1918 armistice and the release of the arena by the military, the amateurs really began to shine. A four-team league was formed consisting of the Foundation Club, the Senators, the Two Jacks, and the Elks. The player rosters of that day included active members of our community, like John Wixon, Huey Burnett, and George and Alex Straith. There was also Vic High Principal Harry Smith and Vic West soccer players Mulcahy, Shanley, and Copes. Lester Patrick, who'd hung up his skates, returned here to resume operations and set about rebuilding his aristocrats. Rebuilding proved to be slow, but the aristocrats signed players like Harold Hartz, Clem Lachlan, Frank Fredrickson, Jocko Anderson, Slim Halderson, Wally Elmer, and Howard Meeking. But it wasn't until 1923 that things really began to look up. When the owners of the Seattle Arena decided their huge building could generate more profit as a parking garage, they disbanded their team and the Silver Fox signed four of their top players. Jack Walker, Frank Foyston, Gordon Fraser, and goalie Hap Holmes. With only two teams remaining, the PCHL united with Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, and Saskatoon in the Western Hockey League. When the 1924-25 season rolled around, Lester devoted himself to coaching the newly named Cougars running the arena and teaching his sons Muzz and Lynn the skills of hockey. The Cougars were in top form for the playoffs and beat Saskatoon in the first round. 4,200 fans jammed into the arena to see the Cougars down the Calgary Tigers 2 to nothing. Victoria had claimed the series and earned a crack at the World Championship Stanley Cup against the Montreal Canadiens who were housed at the Empress. That would result in Victoria fans seeing some of the most colorful Eastern hockey players. Players like Oriel Joliet and Shores Vesna. There was a ticket frenzy as fans lined up the night before, and by morning, a line extended down Government Street and up Fort Street to Broad Street. The first game played under Western rules proved to be an exhibition game of speed, stick handling, passing and shooting by the Cougars as they won 5-2. The second game, played in Vancouver under Eastern rules, saw Le Canadien play better, but not good enough, losing 3-1. Howie Morenz was really flying in the third game, scoring three goals for a 4-2 Montreal victory. In the fourth matchup, the Cougars were clicking and took the series with an amazing display and a final score of 6-1. At last, the Stanley Cup had come to Victoria. The 1925-26 Cougars had the same lineup. The Regina franchise went to Portland and that resulted in the league name changing to the Western Hockey League. When the league season dawned, Victoria fans thought they would sit back and watch the Cougars sweep through another championship. Now in the end, Victoria did win, but the struggle was one of the epics of this sport. The Cougars, who had their sights set on defending their world championship, were not to be denied. Montreal Maroons would be their opposition. In their second season, the Maroons won the NHL championship and would host the Stanley Cup championship in the new forum. Canada's most up-to-date arena, seating more than 10,000 fans. Montreal made quick work of the Cougars by winning the series three games to one. As the Cougars headed home, little did they know they had played their final game in Victoria uniforms. 
With Chicago and Detroit wanting pro hockey and New York looking for a second club, it was agreed to turn over the players of the six Western teams. That $300,000 deal sent the Cougars to Detroit, and for their initial NHL season, they were called the Detroit Cougars before being renamed the Red Waves. With the sale of the professional Cougars, the amateurs had the arena to themselves. The seniors played a good crowd, with the Shells winning the Victoria title, but losing out to the Vancouver Towers in the BC playoff. A commercial league featuring such teams as the Rink Rats, Plimley and Ritchie, Travelers, and International Engineering School also had a good following. Then came November 11th, 1929. Fire destroyed the historical wooden building. A throng standing around the blazing building and embers on the following morning recalled the many exciting times they'd had in it. Years passed and hockey was regulated to roller skates until 1940 when discussions on the building of a new arena were held. Someone suggested the Old Willows Horse Show building to be converted into an arena. In 1941, the City Council approved $6,500 to be used to improve the Horse Show building if any citizen or group would put in an ice-making system and operate the arena. Only one man, Barney Olson, was willing to take a chance and had the necessary equipment installed. There was a great joy when, after a dozen years, Victoria had a second arena. Victoria became prominent in amateur hockey as the Pacific Coast Amateur League was formed with Victoria Babcos, Nanaimo, Vancouver, and New Westminster. When the 1942-43 season rolled around, a number of former National Hockey League and minor pro players were stationed here in the armed services and shipbuilding plants. An island league was formed with entries from the Army, Navy, Air Force, Nanaimo, and the Victoria Machinery Depot. Chuck Rayner a longtime star goalkeeper with the New York Rangers played in net for the Navy. The soldiers went on to win the BC Championship Savage Cup and then moved on to Calgary for a series with the Alberta Champions where they earned the right to play Winnipeg RCAF for the Western Canadian Championship. The soldiers were again victorious and that meant the local army team could play for the Canadian Amateur Championships Allen Cup in Winnipeg. Before another season rolled around, most of the players in the service teams were ordered overseas. With their departure, senior amateur hockey slumped. But through the efforts of Ivan Temple, Doug Fletcher and Eddie Kelpin, Victoria boys got a start in minor hockey. Also, the Victoria Figure Skating Club, which had organized in the Patrick Arena, was re-established with their Ice Caper show being a big hit. Then came another cruel blow. For the second time, fire struck. The old shingle-covered wooden building and similar adjoining sports center went up in a spectacular nighttime fire. This time, however, citizens didn't let the fire keep them down. Why not, they asked, build a municipal arena as a memorial to the men who had given their lives in the Second World War. But no one wanted to lose a third arena by fire, so it was decided that the memorial arena should be a concrete barrel roof construction and completely fireproof. It took three years to build and cost sort with two additional loans having to be approved. When the Memorial Arena finally opened, the figure was $995,979. It might as well have been a cool $1 million. The arena began operation in 1949. The figure skaters had their third home and young people were again skating. Hundreds of boys began to play minor ice hockey. The capital city was again in the throes of a hockey fever. 